want to talk about faith today. Now, um, when I lived in Ohio, I had a Dutch colonial house, and I had this big tree in the yard. In fact, I had several trees, a lot of trees in my yard, but the one, I decided to put a tree house in it for my kids. And the tree house was like 10 feet off the ground, and it, uh, it, it was a tree that was straight up, no fork in it, so I had to hang it off of two limbs. And, uh, but I had this tree house, but the tree next to it went up on an angle. And so I built a little porch across that. And then I had a nautical rope that dropped down. And the only way you could get in it was to climb that rope, get on that little bridge, go across into the tree house. Very cool. Then what I did is I climbed up the top of the tree till it was kind of really bending. And I tied a rope on, and the kids could get, climb up the one nautical rope, get on the bridge, and then they could grab that rope and swing completely across the yard, come back, and land on the bridge. Does that sound cool and fun? Yeah, we should do one of those for the kids here on the church property. <laughs> so, my two older boys, that was no problem, but my youngest son, he was too small, you know, to, so I'd have to actually get a little, little bit of a ladder myself to pick him up and put him up on the porch. And I would say to him, Jeremy, jump. I'll catch you. And you know what? He would do it. He would jump because he believed in me. Now my older two boys, yeah, they weren't jumping. Why? Well, they knew they were heavier, and if they jumped, I'd probably catch them on the second bounce. <laughs> and they said, no, no, they, they did not trust me. Now, the word faith has synonyms. Believe, trust, okay, commit, okay, these are all in that, in that family uh, uh, of uh, believing. And, and today I want to talk about genuine faith, the kind that is like my son Jeremy. When I said jump, he jumped and I caught him, right? That kind, where, where, where you truly, genuine faith, the real thing, not a fake thing. I want to talk about the fact that genuine faith begins with a new birth. It begins with a new birth. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Now, you remember I told you the nature of this book is cyclical? This idea of believe has already been mentioned in John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. And the whole idea of being born again has already been mentioned in 1 John 2.29. Now he brings it up again. He wants us to know about believing, so he nails us again. It's like you didn't get it the first time I told you. It's like the preacher that got up and he preached the same verse like six weeks in a row. And the congregation asked the leadership to go to him, tell him, you can move on. And so he said to them, well, I will move on. When, I'll move on to chapter 2 when you start practicing chapter 1. You see, sometimes we need that reinforcement. John is so concerned on this idea of really things you need to know. He says you really need to know that you have to believe and you really need to know, because he comes back to this theme in this verse, that you have to have a new birth in order to believe. Why? There's a reason why. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. You were a spiritual zombie. People ask me, do you believe in zombies? Of course I believe in zombies. I was a zombie. You were a zombie. What do you mean a zombie? You were physically alive but spiritually dead. That's what this verse says. You were dead in your transgressions and your sin. And you lived in them. You lived like a sinner. You lived like a zombie. You really didn't have life. You only had physical life. You didn't have spiritual life. The passage goes on to say, but God has made you alive. How did he make you alive? For you have been born again through the living and enduring word of God. Why is that? It's because faith comes from hearing. So, I've had this illustration before. Over here, I was a dead zombie, man. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. Somebody preached the word, but I'm a deaf man. Remember Lazarus? Lazarus died and he was put in the tomb, four days dead. They said he already was stinking. 
my socks stink at the end of the day. Could you imagine what he smelled like after four days? <laughs> He's dead. And, and so Jesus comes along and says, this is all for the glory of God. And he cries out to the dead man who can't hear him, right? He can't hear? He's dead. Jesus cries out, Lazarus, come forth. And you remember what happened? It's a good thing he said Lazarus because he came out all bound up. If he had not said Lazarus, every tomb would have opened and all these zombies would have come out, right? Lazarus, come forth. So I was eight years old. I don't know what age you were, where it was. I was at camp. The man preached the word. God used the word to inject into me a new life. And my first response of my new life, my first breath, my first cry was, I believe in Jesus as my Savior from my sins. That's the way it works. Every day I walk around a bunch of, bunch of zombies. They're everywhere. They're in the grocery store. They're in my neighborhood. They're at work. They're in the schools. Zombies everywhere. They need someone to tell them the gospel message because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So when I pro pronounce the word of God to this person who's dead, he's a dead person, he doesn't know anything spiritually, God the Holy Spirit uses that word, gives him life, and he responds in faith and believes, and he repents of his sins, and he has a whole new life in Christ. No one comes to Christ without the word of God. And if we are mum, mm, no one comes to faith. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's why we send missionaries out. That's why we have missionaries in Hungary, so that they're preaching to the people there. That's because we're supposed to be doing it here. We can't be everywhere, so we send everybody everywhere to do it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. No, that's what this verse says. Everyone who believes... If I am believing right now, it's because I have had previously been born of God. That's the perfect tense in the Greek language. You stand, if you believe, you stand in your present condition of believing because you have previously been born again and that new birth continues on. That's the whole idea of the Greek New Testament's perfect tense that is found here. So when I was eight years old and God infused life within me, the Holy Spirit gave me life, the new birth... I still have it to this very day. I will have it forever. Isn't that wonderful? I can never lose my salvation. I am eternally secure in Jesus Christ. Wow. Second thing I want to notice here, well, I want to go to this verse 4. By grace are you, you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You see, God did it all. God said to me, I can never pat myself on the back and say, good job. You know why? Because I was dead. I could not respond. So he had to summon me with, with, with coming forth and, and, and something I could not resist, and I came forth believing. It's all the gift of God. It's the gift of God. Second thing I want to notice here in the passage is that, that in verses 1 through 3, it says, <clears throat> genuine faith actually loves God. We didn't always love God. Not always. There came a point when you were, were born again, had that new birth, faith, and you love God. Everyone who loves the Father, I don't know how to draw the Father there, God the Father, uh, uh, but I use this bright, shiny effulgence of light and glory. God. Isn't that what Jesus said? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Genuine faith turns from not loving God to loving God. It also turns from not loving other people to loving other people in the name of Jesus. Everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. It's not hard to do. A lot of people think that Christianity is a bunch of rules, do's and don'ts, and it is not. It is simply one thing, one thing. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, and if you do that, you're going to automatically love your neighbor as yourself, and if you do that, you will fulfill all the commandments. Not because you have to, because you want to. <laughs> you just want to. 
That sets Christianity apart from every other religion because in every other religion, you've got to work for your salvation. And in Christianity, God saved you so that you would just love him and live for him. That's beautiful. That is so beautiful. Genuine faith involves a new birth, and genuine faith also involves being an overcomer. An overcomer. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Years ago when I was reading in the Daily Bread, how many of you do Daily Bread? Daily Bread? You read the devotional Daily Bread? They're awesome. Awesome. I was reading in the Daily Bread, and the one day it was just a poem on the page. They rarely do that. The whole page was just this poem. I liked it so much, I tried to commit it to memory. I said, I had a battle fierce today within my place of prayer. I went to meet and talk with God, but I found Satan there. He said, you can't really pray. You lost out long ago. You may say words while on your knees, but you can't pray, you know. So then I pulled my helmet down, way down upon my ears, and found a help to still his voice and allay all my fears. I checked my other armor o'er, my feet in peace were shod, my loins with truth were girt about, my sword the word of God, my righteous breastplate still was on, my heart's love to protect, my shield of faith was still intact, his, his fiery darts bounced back. So then I prayed in Jesus' name, and I prayed the ble- precious blood, while Satan sneaked away in shame, I stayed and met with God. <laughs> Isn't that great? We are the overcomers who believe. And that's what the text goes on to say. This is the victory that that overcomes the world, even our faith. I come back to that faith. Here we are. God says, like I did to Jeremy, just jump and trust me. Trust me. Commit yourself, like jumping out, and you're going to commit yourself to my care and, and that I'll take care of you. That is how we overcome. We trust God, not ourselves. We trust God, not the government. We trust God, not the pastor. We trust God. We trust God. We believe. We believe. We overcome. It's our faith. Listen to what he says. Who is it that overcomes the world? Quiz. Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You're not going to find this in Hollywood. They make some pretty good movies once in a while. I find like maybe one out of the whole year. Usually it's got some moral value in it. And it surprises me that Hollywood did this, right? Because the world doesn't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Those who do overcome the world. They overcome the world. Think Whatever you think is in the world, they, they overcome it. They overcome it. It's our faith. We believe. We believe. Genuine faith also testifies. It testifies. This is the one who came. You see, the apostle's testimony is this. He told us from the very beginning, very first verses here, it's repeating it again. This book is nothing but a bunch of recycling the same material over and over. And you know what? That's what preachers do. I've been preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ since I was 15 years old. My first sermon was a Detroit City Rescue Mission. Here I am, a 15-year-old kid. Now, maybe 16. I think I was 16 at that time. Here I am. I'm preaching to all these men, and I go to make my point that we're all sinners, and this old drunk stood up and said, we're all sinners, and he sat down. (laughs) He stole my point. I've been building everything up to this, and he stole it from me. But obviously, he was getting what I was talking about, Right? I was testifying. This is, the, this is the one who came into the world and we're to testify. We're to testify. Testify. Jesus came into the world. It says, he came by water. 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 He keeps saying, theologians are divided what's going on here. Some think it's his baptism waters that actually launches his public ministry where his testimony was up. Oh, God the Holy Spirit said, this is my, be- God the Holy Spirit descended on, on Jesus, and God the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So we got a double testimony as to who Jesus is. He came by water, but he also came by blood. And they, and they look at this as, this is the culmination of his public ministry. 
from baptism until his death, they testified about the life of Jesus Christ. He said he died by, by, by water and, and, the, and the blood. And I see other theologians say, no, it's referring to when Jesus was hanging on the cross. And they thrust that spear in his side and outburst the water and the blood, indicating he died of a cardiac arrest because he was actually suffocated to death by having his, his lungs collapse because he was short on blood. He's dying and he's bleeding and dying for us as a sacrifice for sin. He was really dead. This idea that he was in a swoon, no, no, he really wasn't dead. And that he was just in a swoon, an unconscious state, and, and then three days later, because it, the tomb was cool, uh, and it revived his body, and he came to life because he wasn't really dead. That's a bunch of baloney because he really was dead. <laughs> he was really dead. He goes on and says, This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And this is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is truth. That's what Jesus said in the Gospel of John. He's the Spirit of truth. He's told us this already in the book of John. He repeats it again. He wants you to know the Holy Spirit always confirms the truth. The Holy Spirit confirms the truth. (laughs) So he comes up to this point. There are three that testify. We're talking about testifying about Jesus Christ. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And they are all in agreement that Jesus is the Son of God. We accept man's testimony. Wow, okay, here's, he's going to make an argument from the lesser to the greater. If what is good by the lesser, just think how much better it is by the greater, all right? If sinful men make a testimony and you believe that testimony, God's testimony is greater. The testimony of God, listen, he said that, that testimony trumps all other testimonies because God cannot lie. God's, he said God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. The word of God, the whole Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. The gospels declare the life and passion and ministry of Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and then the book of Acts proclaims how the power of the Holy Spirit given by Jesus starts the church and what the church does. And then we get to the letters. All the letters are pointing back to the fact that Jesus is our Savior. This is how we should live because of him. It's all, the whole Bible is about Jesus. The whole Bible is about Jesus. Beginning to end. Beginning to end. It's about his son. Anyone who believes, this is the testimony about anyone who believes puts that trust. Like my son Jeremy jumping into my arms. 10 feet up. He makes that lunge. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. And anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. Wow, this is a powerful passage. In my reading, I came across a story about uh, uh, a pastor. And uh, it was a Sunday evening service back in the day when they had Sunday evening services. And uh, they, they just finished the routine hymns that they, they were singing. And he was about to come up in, into the pulpit. And, and he noticed an elderly man there that he knew from his youth. <laughs> and so uh, he got up in the pulpit and, and he said, hey, before I have my sermon this evening, I'm going to a call on, and he called him by name. He said, uh, uh, this is the father of one of my uh, uh, friends when I was a child, and he's a pastor. I'm going to have him come up. And he's an old man at this point. He comes up to the pulpit, and uh, the pastor said, you just share anything that's on your heart, whatever you want to share. And they're like, that's an open mic for a preacher. You never know where that's going to go, right? <laughs> and so, so he comes up, and he says, there was a father a son and a son's friend, and they went sailing off the Pacific coast. And they got far enough out that uh, all of a sudden a storm arose and got between them. They couldn't make it back. And the storm was so fierce that it, as much as he tried, uh, this father with with these two teenage boys, uh, he couldn't couldn't keep it under control, and, and it capsized. And as the 
the, the waves threw him over and a capsized. He struggled to get back towards the boat and he looked for the other two boys and, and the boys were in different directions and, and, but he had the, the lifeline right there and he grabs the lifeline and now he's got to make the decision. Who does he throw the lifeline to? His son or his son's friend? In a split second, he makes the decision. And in that split second, he says, my son knows Jesus as his Savior. To die is to go to be with Jesus. His friend is not a Christian. To die is to go to hell. So he turns to his son and he says, I love you, son. And he throws the lifeline to the son's friend and pulls him in, pulls him in. By the time he gets him back to the capsized boat to hang on, he turns to his son and he sees no one there. He throws the lifeline in vain. The son is gone, never to be seen again. There have been some teenage boys who were not paying attention to anything in the service until he started telling the story. <laughs> they captivated them. At this point, he says, that father knew exactly what God the Father felt like when he made the decision to save us from our sins. He said, listen to your pastor. He's going to throw out the lifeline grab the lifeline, and receive Jesus as your Savior. The old man went and sat back down. Pastor got up and he preached a rather short sermon, but then he gave an invitation. And the invitation was with hopes that someone would respond and come forward like a Billy Graham crusade. But no one did. No one came forward. As soon as the last song was over, the teenage boys that had not been paying attention until he talked come running over to him, and they said, man, old man, that was, a, that was a good story. Too bad it's not very realistic. No father would sacrifice his son for somebody else. The old man looked at him and said, not very realistic. Yeah, I agree. Not very realistic. And then he said to him, but... I am that father, and your pastor is my son's best friend. When I read that story, man, that grabbed me. That grabbed me. This is the testimony given about his son. And this is the testimony God has given us eternal life. This was found in the very second verse of the book. He talked about eternal life. Here he is again. And this life is in his son. This, this recycling, recycling the story all the way through the book. This life is in his son. He who has the son has life. I like this idea. This life is in his son. Often when I'm sharing my faith with someone one-on-one, -on -one, I'll try to find my pocket New Testament, which I don't have on me at the moment, but I have a little pocket New Testament. I almost carry it all the time, but it, I just don't have it today with me. And I pull it out, and, and uh, I usually have a buck in it, okay? And my illustration is simply this. Pretend that the dollar is eternal life, right? It's eternal life. And I got the Bible, the Little Testament, and I stick it, and I said, pretend that this New Testament is Jesus, and I take the buck, and I stick it right in it, and I close it up and said, now, in order to get the dollar, what do you have to do? you got to take the Bible. <laughs> in order to get eternal life, you've got to take the Son. Jesus goes so far as to say this, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. The moment you believe, Why? You've been born again, remember? You were a zombie. God, you heard the word of God. God the Holy Spirit infused life in you. And you believe you got eternal life. He said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Right now, you got it. But whoever rejects the Son 
will not see life for God's wrath. Where is it? It's remaining on him. It, remaining. It means you, you are under the wrath of God. You are a dead zombie. You just haven't made it to hell yet. <laughs> Boy. Listen, that's why we have to share our faith. We have to share our faith. Here's what I'm saying. Genuine faith begins with a new birth. It has to begin with a new birth. We talked about that. We talked about how Nicodemus came to Jesus by night a couple weeks ago, and Jesus told him he had to be born again. It begins with a new birth. That new birth comes because somebody preached the word, and the Holy Spirit used that word to give you life. You believe, you repent, you begin a Christian life. Listen, it all begins with a new birth. That new birth shows up in your life because now you love God. Isn't it amazing? People who never wanted to go to church, once they accept Jesus as Savior, all of a sudden they want to go to church. Why? They want to be with God. They want to learn about God. They want to be with God's people. It all changes at that moment when they accept Jesus Christ. I always question the person who says to me, I don't need to go to church. I can worship God out in nature. Well, that is true, but it is not the heart of God. If you really are a Christian, you want to be where they worship God and you want to be with God's people. It's just the way it works. Just the way it works. You overcome the world. What Your faith, your faith, that faith that you placed in Jesus as Savior when you were born again, that faith continues on. And that faith is what causes you to overcome the world. He goes on, he says, and that's what causes you to testify about Jesus. Everyone has a story to tell. Everyone. Our next, you know, after church Bible study that we're going to do in the coming year is going to be about my story. How do I tell my story about Jesus? You have a story. It's your story. And we're going to share with you how you can work your story into everyday conversation so that you can introduce people to Jesus by just telling your own story. And you'll never forget it because it's your story. <laughs> Until you're senile or got dementia, you'll be able to tell your story. And so it'll be your story. Every, when an opportunity arises, you'll immediately be able to say, well, you know, uh, my life is kind of like, and then you just talk how it happened, and we're going to share with you how to weave the Bible scriptures in it and how to actually share your faith with people, and they're just going to think it's an ordinary, everyday conversation because that's the way it should be, testifying about Jesus, testifying about Jesus. The result, eternal life to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for your word today. We want to be those people with a genuine faith. So genuine, Lord, that it comes naturally for us to testify about it. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Realizing, Lord, when our ship capsized, you sent your Son to die for us so that the lifeline might come out to us. We grabbed hold of that by faith because we were born again and you drew us in. And Lord, we pray that through our testimonies, others will be drawn in. Perhaps someone here today has not yet placed that kind of faith in Jesus, given him their all, a commitment, a trust, a faith, a true belief. And we pray that right now they would. They would say, Lord, I, I realize I need that kind of faith in you, and I'm giving it to you now. Thank you for dying on the cross to take away my sins. I believe you did that for me. I believe you rose from the dead for me. And in my faith, you'll give me the victory, just as it says in the Bible. Save me, O Lord. Lord, we know if they say anything close to that with faith in their heart, to you, a confession of their sinful condition and their trust in you, you will save them. That is what your word says. You will change them from the inside out. They will be one of those born again, expressing their faith in you to have their, life's tra their life transformed. To that end, we pray, Lord, that we will live out that transformed life because we have been born again. This we pray in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.